In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Lately, I started watching a new television show that's produced by AMC. It's called The Walking Dead. Uh, has anyone here seen The Walking Dead? Okay, a couple of people. Yeah, yeah. The Walking Dead is uh, of a genre that they sometimes call uh, uh, zombie apocalypse. And what that means is that the scenario of the show is that some sort of strange plague has taken hold of the earth and killed most of the population, turning most of them into zombies who only have a kind of lower brainstem function and all they want to do is kind of stumble around and eat flesh. Now, a lot of times this is a setup for a very campy sort of series, a very campy kind of having fun with the whole zombie thing. But this series is different. Uh, Walking Dead actually takes this premise entirely seriously. And every episode is a really gut-wrenching, difficult experience. Normally, when I get obsessive about a television show, I just watch it in a row, marathon style. Uh, With this TV show, you can't do that. You can watch maybe two episodes, and then you have to watch something like uh, humorous clips from the show Ellen or something like that to kind of (laughs) cleanse the palate and kind of renormalize your anxiety level because this is an anxious world that these people inhabit. It's a small band of survivors trying to uh, outwit the hordes of zombies and trying to survive in a world that is incredibly hostile where suffering and death are constant companions and danger is just, just a way of life. Now, that is a hyper-dramatic backdrop for some very deep existential questions. One of the deepest ones that runs throughout the series is this question of how do human beings respond to great suffering? We're not talking about kind of paper cuts and, and run-of-the-mill disappointments. We're talking about what do you do when most of the people that you know around you that you have loved have died? And when everything that you found meaningful in the world has evaporated, what do you do? And there are several answers to this question that are kind of teased out in the show. One of them is suicide. Suicide is a recurring theme in the series as people choose to opt out of living in such a, a degraded and, and destructive world. And this band of survivors, they're, they're often unclear about why they're even trying to survive in this world, except that they are human beings and they just want to live. Um, God is mostly absent from this series, uh, except that often characters well pray, sometimes quite deliberately, um, but their prayers are often seen as ineffective, and God is either absent or fickle or maybe judgmental uh, in his presence. So it's a very kind of hyper-dramatic and difficult show to watch in some ways. But what's interesting to me is that one of the reasons that it's difficult to watch is that the experience resonates for us, because this world of, of anxiety and danger is not so different from places that we know on the earth. Um, recently I saw a sort of quasi-documentary about uh, Unit 731 in World War II, has anyone ever heard of Unit 731? It was a Japanese uh, uh, prisoner of war camp where they did uh, biological warfare experiments on mostly Chinese prisoners. Um, there were approximately 10 to 40,000 people killed uh, on that site. And uh, the weapons that were developed there, particularly strains of the plague that were spread by fleas, they were dropped some special bombs. Um, there were about 200,000 to 600,000 people killed as a result of the, the biological weapons that were developed there. Um, I think there there are two reasons, at least, why you haven't heard of Unit 731, most of you. Uh, One is that the victims were mostly Chinese, honestly, and and we focus in the West more on the victims of of the Holocaust in uh, in Europe. And so when we think of the atrocities of World War II, we often tend to focus on the German concentration camps, which were, of course, uh, you know, horrible. Um, But Unit 731 uh, in Manchuria, uh, many people died there as well. The second reason why you haven't heard of it is that it was in the strategic interests of the Allied powers after the war to suppress it. Uh, Because you see, both the the Russians and the United States and other Allied countries wanted to benefit from the experiments that were done on this site. They wanted to pick up where those scientists had left off in the development of biological and chemical weapons. So just as in the case of many of the the rocket scientists of, of World War II in Germany, Uh, some of the doctors who had been involved in these medical experiments in Japan were basically given freedom in return for working for the Allied powers. Uh, The most notorious of them was uh, Shiro Ishii, and uh, he was the main sort of doctor in charge of the camp, and uh, he ended up dying of natural causes uh, in his 80s in Maryland. So what does that tell you? Uh, It's kind of interesting because uh, Joseph uh, Mendelez, who was this, this horrible doctor in Germany who did the experiments on people in the concentration camps, there, um, he ended up fleeing, and actually he died too of natural causes in, in Argentina, but in his case he was pursued, and uh, the Nazi hunters were very close on his trail when he died of, I think, a heart attack or, or a stroke in, I believe, Argentina. Um, 
So this is a world that we're actually familiar with. Um, this is something within human experience, this kind of, of utter destruction and suffering. It exists in the world uh, in the past, but it also exists in our world now. Uh, some of you may have seen the, the Coney documentary that has been going around on the Internet. Um, it's a sort of profile of this warlord in Africa named Joseph Coney who has uh, created a child army by basically kidnapping children and brainwashing them and forcing them to, to work in his army and to, uh, and to kill their parents and, and, and everyone else that they, they know. So this is a world that in some ways we do, in fact, inhabit. We're fortunate that in our society we don't have this kind of thing immediately pressing upon us, but there are those in the world right now who do live with this kind of suffering. The Buddhists have, have a thing, a concept called dukkha. Uh, just simply the first truth of Buddhism is that life is suffering. Life is suffering. The Christian version of the same notion is something about original sin. The difference between the two is that for Buddhists, uh, suffering is inherent in the entire cosmic structure. Uh, for Christians, we, we don't go that far. We say that the world was basically created good and that we were created good. However, as a result of, of having the freedom of choice, evil comes into the world and, and we do evil things and that the bad things happen basically because of a kind of uh, something about the human person and the possibilities of freedom. Um, so it's, it's a very different sort of thing. But it brings up this question, well, what do we do in the response to this kind of suffering that exists in the world? And it's exactly that uh, moment which we are caught in liturgically in a sense because this is the eve of Holy Week. We are coming into the great season of Easter. And so it is what a friend of mine called Deep Lent. This is the deepest, darkest time before the dawn begins to come for us in the Christian church. And so the passage that we have from the Gospel of John that goes along with that is this, this section where you know, things are starting to get tense, of course, between Jesus and the religious officials, and he has this whole moment where some of the Gentiles, the Greeks, it says, uh, decide that they want to come to this Jesus character. And for Jesus, this is an apocalyptic sign. This is a sign that people who are not Jewish are being called to him. And he uses this as a moment to say, basically, he is not just here for the Jewish nation. That he is here to bring all people to himself. And so this reading is paired with uh, the reading uh, in, from Isaiah of, of this kind of great new covenant that's being made with all of God's people who will all be drawn to God in such a way that we won't even need teachers. You know, We won't even need teachers because we will all know God so deeply uh, in our hearts. So Jesus is proclaiming something, some kind of a hope in the face of the suffering of the world on the eve of his, his resurrection hasn't happened yet, but on the eve of his trial in a way. For me, this really hits home because uh, last week at this time, exactly pretty much, uh, Bruce Kirkpatrick Hill, who was our interim organist here, uh, passed away. Uh, most of you know that, some of you may not. Uh, Bruce was a, a personal friend of, of both myself and, and Betsy for about six years, six or seven years. And uh, we had worked some professionally. He had played a couple of services here, and he had been rehearsing with the choir for the past several weeks, uh, getting them ready for Holy Week. Uh, he had been sick briefly and hospitalized briefly here in Toronto, um, and I had visited him in the hospital, and he was anxious to get out, and he was feeling much better. He was released from the hospital. He was cleared to travel. He did one last choir rehearsal here with the choir, and, uh, in which he was very talkative and, and was really looking forward to his vacation time with his wife. And he went to Cuba, and they had a couple of good days together, he and Stephanie. And then, uh, and then he got sick again. He went into the hospital on, uh, on Friday, and he passed away Sunday morning. Um, so processing the grief of, of, of his departure, um, there were sort of two significant services that, that kind of helped me do that, and, which is very appropriate because Bruce was a very liturgical guy. You know, he loved worship. He, he was born to lead church services. And in fact, before he came here to, to be the interim uh, director of music, he and I had, had coffee and croissants, because and, he, he loved croissants. And he, uh, he told me that, uh, that he really felt that he was born to be a church musician. That is what he was on this earth to do, and he was happy to do it here. So um, the first service that happened that really helped me to process this grief uh, was the traditional communion service that we do here once a month or so on Tuesdays. And a few of you were here, and will remember that I had a hard time getting through the sermon because uh, I, in my mind, I was able to make a connection between the scripture passage for that day, which was the feeding of the 5,000 from John, and, and a notion that I had about uh, the meaning of the resurrection and, and part of that, and I'll, I'll get into that in a moment. The second service that we had was yesterday, and it was at St. Mary Magdalene's, where uh, his wife is the director of music, and, uh, and there were 570-some-odd uh, people there. 
at the church. Uh, it was the largest church service that I have ever participated in as a, as a, as a leader. I was the deacon. And um, it had basically an all-star cast of the best church musicians uh, in Toronto and in Canada. Um, the guy that was the organist, um, Larkin, was incredible uh, on the organ, and he's probably the top organist in Canada. And uh, the, the choir was, they had to turn away all kinds of singers because they didn't have enough room in the gallery. And, you know, it was interesting, the sermon was relatively short, uh, maybe seven or eight minutes, because the whole point of that two-hour service was not the sermon. The whole point of that service was the beautiful, beautiful music uh, of all sorts. And it was, it was a real privilege to be a part of that. So 570 people. But what was interesting is that of those 570 people, there are many people that had never met each other. Because Bruce had come into contact with lots of different churches in his career, and he had led all kinds of different choirs, including children's choirs and grown-up choirs and civic choirs, all kinds of different groups. And so you got a sense of the fragmentary pieces of a person's life coming together. And that was what struck me when I was preaching on Tuesday from the feeding of the 5,000, was that when we talk about the resurrection, when we talk about Christ pulling all things into himself, we're not talking about just parts of ourselves in the resurrection. We're not saying that when we experience resurrection, it's just the good parts of us that get into heaven. It's just those parts that we like about ourselves. It's just these kind of disembodied ideas about, you know, what a good person we were that go up to heaven. No, no, no. We believe in a bodily resurrection. And I'm not talking about, you know, zombie corpses coming out of their graves. What I'm talking about is that all those things that we are, all those things that we are come with us in the resurrection. All of us. And that includes, I believe, all those little bits and fragments of us that we have given away to other people to hold on to. So that the resurrection is not just about, you know, us in our best sort of sense, but us in our entire sense. So in the passage from the reading of the 5,000, there's this moment where Jesus insists that all the crumbs be picked up. You know, the bread has gone out, it's been distributed among the people, they've all eaten their fill, and there's these 12 baskets that are brought together of just the crumbs and the broken pieces. And so looking out at a congregation of almost 600 people, I thought about the crumbs. You know, all those little bits of Bruce's life, including bits that were left here at this church that have been gathered up into God's glory. Uh, I see little fragments of Bruce everywhere around here in the last week. Uh, for example, the organ console still has a, uh, a, a coffee cup with a bunch of pencils in it that he would always put out during choir rehearsals so that the musicians could make notes on their, on their papers. Um, this was, uh, his wife Stephanie said, you know, this is a model of, of a funeral in the digital age, or the post-Facebook age. Facebook got mentioned repeatedly, including in the sermon, because on Facebook, everyone has been posting pictures of Bruce. And so we have pictures of Bruce, often in shorts, in places as diverse as Canterbury and, and, and uh, Northern Africa and, and uh, you know, Toronto, of course, everywhere. Uh, like lots and lots of places. He loved to travel. And Bruce in lots of different walks of life. Bruce wearing a kilt. He was famous for making some sort of a flaming haggis dish on uh, Robbie Burns' day. day. Uh, you know, Bruce in all kinds of different aspects of his life. And all those fragments are somehow pulled together. As that is true for an individual life, so it is true for our life together. That all those little fragments of the world are drawn into Christ's glory. He says that he will draw all people to himself when he is lifted up. Well, that lifting up is the cross. We as Christians are not called to kind of forget about the suffering of the world or to ignore it, but actually to go through it to the other side. To return to the question that's raised by the walking dead, how are we supposed to live in a world that has the kind of suffering of, of depicted in that show or the kind of suffering that we know exists in the world from the history of war atrocities? I would say that we don't live in this world, in a sense. And in fact, that we are called to die continually in this world that we die as we give ourselves away to the possibility of a love so powerful that it can see us through the gateway and passage of death to the other side, to our resurrection. So, beloved, on this eve of Eastertide, as we get ready to experience the joy of Easter, I think it's appropriate for us to take a, a hard look at the cross and not be afraid of the suffering that we see there or that we hear about in the news or that we might see in other places in our life, but to recognize that we as Christians have a response to that suffering. We have a response to the cross because what we do when we see the cross is we see a love so powerful that it has fractured the very nature of the created order and allowed a pathway through the darkness of sin and death to new life. And if that life is a life for all people, 
because all people are called into the glory that is Christ.